today we are going to start a new topic and that is the eigen value problems so far we considered real vectors real matrices now even if matrix is a real matrix its eigen values they can be complex so that is why now our underlying field is going to be filled of complex numbers so we will be considering complex matrices then the vectors also will be complex eigen values they are defined for square matrices we will show that if a is n by n matrix either real or complex then its roots or the eigen values they are given by roots of a polynomial of degree n now as a consequence of fundamental theorem of algebra we know that if a polynomial has degree n then it has got exactly n zeros or n roots counted according to their multiplicity that means we will count if a zero is repeated twice it will be considered as two zeros now when we consider polynomial of degree bigger than or equal to 5 then we cannot have a formula for finding its roots like if you have got a quadratic polynomial then we can write its two zeros in terms of the coefficients of our polynomial if you have got ax square plus bx plus c is equal to 0 then the roots can be written in terms of the coefficients a b c this will not be possible when your polynomial is of degree bigger than or equal to 5 so that is why for calculating the eigen values our methods they are going to give us only approximation this was not the case with solution of system of linear equations when we considered gauss elimination method or its variants then the error came because of the finite precision whereas the method was exact method in contrast for eigen values our method will be giving only an approximation so one tries to find as much information possible as of eigen values by say looking at a matrix so there are some special matrices for which we will study what are their their eigen values that means we can if the matrix is a real symmetric matrix then its eigen values they are going to be all real and similar results then we will have some localization results that means we will find a region in the complex plane which is going to contain all our eigen values we are going to consider power method for finding the dominant eigen value of a matrix and then there are some variants of this method i am going to describe what is known as qr method for finding eigen values at present that is the most popular and the best possible method available for calculating eigen values or rather calculating approximations to eigen values of our matrix a now it is beyond this course to prove convergence of qr method the description of qr method can be given easily and that is what i will do so now we are going to start with complex vectors when we consider the real vectors and complex vectors for real vectors what we had done was you can add two vectors so that is component wise addition you multiply a vector by a scalar so you multiply each component of your vector by that number so these things remain same for complex vectors it will be the real numbers they are replaced by complex numbers so again addition of two vectors will be component wise multiplication by a scalar will be same as before then 
matrix into vector multiplication will be exactly same as before. There will be a change in the definition of inner product, because we have to take into consideration the complex numbers. Then we had defined one norm infinity norm for real vectors that definition remains exactly the same. The corresponding induced matrix norm, the proof will have slight modifications, but let me not get into those details. It they are the formula which you obtain is exactly the same as before. So, now let us quickly consider complex vectors, then the inner product, the vector norm and the matrix norm. So, uh, let us look at the complex vectors and the uh, corresponding operations. So, we have got z to be a complex vector z 1, z 2, z n. So, each z i is going to be a complex number. W is another n by 1 vector. As I said before, z plus w will be component wise addition. So, it is z 1 plus w 1, z 2 plus w 2 plus z n plus w n. Alpha times z will be each component will get multiplied by alpha, then inner product. So, here when we had real vectors, then the inner product was x comma y was summation x i y i. Now, here changes you will consider z i w i bar, w i bar is the complex conjugate. Now, when you consider inner product of z with itself, it will be summation i goes from 1 to n z i z i bar. So, you have complex number, you are multiplying by complex conjugate. So, it will be summation i goes from 1 to n mod z i square. So, thus inner product of z with itself will be bigger than or equal to 0 and it will be equal to 0 if and only if z is a 0 vector. When you consider inner product of w with z, it will be summation w i z i bar by our definition, which will be same as summation i goes from 1 to n z i w i bar and then complex conjugate. So, that means it is z comma w bar. So, we have got conjugate symmetry. Inner product of w with z is complex conjugate of inner product of z with w. This is linearity in the first variable z plus v w will be summation i goes from 1 to n z i plus v i into w i bar split the summation into two summations. The first summation will be nothing but inner product of z with w and the second summation is inner product of v with w. Similarly, if you consider alpha z comma w, this will be summation i goes from 1 to n alpha z i w i bar. Now, alpha is independent of i. So, it will come out of the summation sign. What remains in the summation? that is inner product of z with w. So, our inner product will be linear in the first variable. So, these are the properties of the inner product. The first is positive definiteness, second is conjugate symmetry and the third property is linearity in the first variable. When you consider z comma alpha w, then alpha will come out as alpha bar because of the conjugate symmetry. So, inner product is conjugate linear in the second variable. So, this is the difference between real inner product and complex inner product that real inner product was symmetric. Now, this is conjugate symmetric and we had linearity in both the variables for real inner product whereas, now complex inner product is going to be linear in the first variable, whereas conjugate linear in the second variable. Otherwise, it is exactly similar. Now, we had Cauchy-Schwarz inequality for real inner product. So, there is Cauchy-Schwarz inequality for complex inner product also and using this Cauchy-Schwarz inequality, one considers the induced norm. So, that is induced norm by the inner product. So, one shows that it satisfies various properties of norm. 
So, here it is inner product of z with z is summation i goes from 1 to n mod z i square. We define norm z 2 to be positive square root of z comma z and the Cauchy Schwarz inequality is modulus of z comma w is less than or equal to 2 norm of z into 2 norm of w. I want you to notice that our complex inner product, it is a map from C n cross C n to C. So, in general our complex inner product is a complex number, but when you consider inner product of a vector z with itself, then it is going to be a positive real number and that is why you can take its positive square root and then obtain a real number. In fact, the number is going to be bigger than or equal to 0 and that is our Euclidean norm. So, norm z 2 is positive square root summation i goes from 1 to n mod z i square. Norm z 2 will be bigger than or equal to 0. It will be equal to 0 if and only if z is equal to 0 vector that will follow from positive definiteness of inner product norm alpha z will be equal to mod alpha times norm z. So, it follows from the definition and the triangle inequality norm of z plus w is less than or equal to norm z plus norm w. So, it is for the triangle inequality that we need the Cauchy Schwarz inequality. So, this is about the two norm. Now, analogously one can define one norm and a infinity norm. So, norm z 1 is going to be summation i goes from 1 to n mod z i and norm z infinity to be maximum of modulus of z i 1 less than or equal to i less than or equal to n. So, in the definition there is no difference instead of real numbers we have got complex numbers, but you are taking its modulus for two norm we are taking summation mod z i square. So, this modulus is important for real inner product space or for if the vector is real whether I write x i square or whether I write mod x i square the answer is the same. Whereas, for the complex number it is important that you should take modulus of z i square. Now, we are going to look at the induced matrix norm. So, if you are given any vector norm, then you define norm of the matrix to be maximum of norm a x by norm x, x not equal to 0 and then for one norm and infinity norm. That means, if you are taking or if you are fixing vector norm to be one norm, then look at the corresponding induced matrix norm. For that we obtained an expression in terms of the elements of the matrix. Similar thing was possible for norm A infinity, whereas for the two norm we have to be satisfied only with an upper bound. So, here the expressions for norm A 1 and norm A infinity they are going to remain to be exactly the same. So, we are looking at the induced matrix norm. So, we have norm a 1 to be column sum norm. So, summation i goes from 1 to n modulus of a i j. So, look at the first column, take the modulus, add it up, do it for all the columns, whatever is the maximum that is norm a 1. Norm a infinity, the expression is obtained by interchanging j and i. So, column sum norm becomes row sum norm. So, we have got norm a infinity to be summation j goes from 1 to n modulus of a i j 1 less than or equal to i less than or equal to n. And then this is the Frobenius norm. So, it is summation over i summation over j mod a i j square raised to half. Norm a 2 is not computable, but norm a Frobenius here it is norm a 2 less than or equal to norm a f. Here this less than or equal to should be bigger than or equal to. Then 
we have got this basic inequality norm a is maximum of norm a z by norm z. So, from here we get norm a z to be less than or equal to norm a into norm z for z belonging to C n. Next we define co conjugate transpose. So, we define the conjugate transpose for a vector as well as for a matrix. So, you take complex conjugate of each entry and then you take transpose. So, if you are taking conjugate transpose of a vector column vector, then its conjugate transpose will be a row vector. If the matrix is square matrix, then conjugate transpose is again going to be equal to the matrix of size n. So, this conjugate transpose we know that matrix multiplication is not commutative. So, if the conjugate transpose commutes with the matrix, then it deserves a special name, it is a special class of matrices and those are known as normal matrices. So, we are going to define normal matrix and then self adjoint matrix q self adjoint matrix these matrices their eigenvalues they have got some special property. So, here is definition z is vector z 1 z 2 z n z star is z bar transpose. So, it becomes a row vector z 1 bar z 2 bar z n bar. Now, inner product of z bit w this is our definition summation z i w i bar. So, in this notation we can write it as w star z. w star is going to be a 1 by n vector z i is n by 1 vector. So, when you take 1 by n vector multiplied by n by 1 vector you are going to get 1 by 1 matrix or you are going to get scalar. So, inner product of z with w will be same as w star z. Next for a matrix A, we define A star to be equal to A bar transpose conjugate transpose. If you repeat the operation A star star is going to give you back matrix A. Then when you consider A b star, this will be A b bar and then transpose. A b bar will be same as A bar into b bar and then its transpose. When you take A bar B bar transpose, the order gets reversed. So, you get B bar transpose A bar transpose. So, this will be equal to B star A star. So, A B star is B star A star and inner product of A z with W will be we have seen that this is W star A z then W star A. I write as A star W star because when you take the complex conjugate, it will become W star A star star that means W star A and this is nothing but Z comma A star W. So, important property A Z comma W A will go to the second variable as A star and here are the special matrices A star A is equal to A A star. So, that is class of normal matrices, then A star is equal to A that is class of self adjoint matrices. If you consider A star is equal to minus A that is skew self adjoint and lastly unitary matrix. So, we have got A star A is equal to identity and now for matrix we know that the left identity is same as the right identity. Uh, left inverse is same as the right inverse. So, that is why you will have if A star A is equal to identity, then automatically A A star is equal to identity. Now, if you take two self adjoint matrix, if you add it up, then again you are going to get a self adjoint matrix. The this result will not be true for product of matrices, because when you will consider A B star then you are you are going to have b star a star. So,
So, if a star is equal to a b star is equal to b does not mean a b star is equal to a b because a b star will be equal to b a. So, these are some of the special matrices and they are going to their eigenvalues they are going to be something special or we can say something more about their eigenvalues. So, now we want to show we want to define eigenvalue eigenvector and then we want to show that they are roots of a characteristic polynomial. So, here is eigenvalue problem our notation is going to be A will be either a real matrix or a co complex matrix, but it has to be a square matrix. One defines eigenvalue and eigenvector only for square matrix. So, definition is a complex number lambda is said to be an eigenvalue of A if there exists a non-zero vector u such that a u is equal to lambda u and in that case u is called an associated eigenvector. This non-zero part is important because if you take a zero vector, then when you apply a matrix A to it, you are going to get a zero vector, so, then a u will be equal to lambda u for any lambda. So, lambda will be eigenvalue provided you have got a non-zero vector u such that a u is equal to lambda u. Now, how to find a lambda? Like, okay, you cannot find, but at least we want some characterization. So, that characterization we are going to show that the lambda is nothing but look at determinant of a minus lambda i. A is matrix which is given to us. Then you look at matrix A minus lambda times identity. Look at its the determinant is something which we can calculate. So, you will get a polynomial in lambda of degree n and our eigenvalue is going to be 0 of this polynomial. So, we start with the definition that lambda is eigenvalue provided we have got a non-zero vector u such that a u is equal to lambda u. So, we have a u is equal to lambda u, u not equal to 0. This will imply that a minus lambda i u is equal to 0 vector, which will mean that a minus lambda i it is a n by n matrix. So, we can consider it as a map from C n to C n any vector in C n you apply a minus lambda i to it you again get a n by 1 vector. So, a minus lambda i from C n to C n it is a map. This map is not 1 to 1 because we have got a minus lambda i u is equal to 0 vector where u is a non-zero vector and a minus lambda i into 0 vector is also equal to 0 vector. So, we have got two vectors u bar and 0 vector which have the same image and that is the 0 vector. So, that is why a minus lambda i will not be 1 to 1. If a minus lambda i is not 1 to 1, it cannot be invertible because for invertibility what we need is our map should be 1 to 1 and on to and in our case in finite dimensional spaces it is sufficient that if a minus lambda i is 1 to 1 then a minus lambda i will be invertible or if a minus lambda i is on to it will be invertible. So, our we are starting with lambda is an eigenvalue u is eigenvector. So, map a minus lambda i will not be 1 to 1 that means, a minus lambda i will not be invertible. So, you have got a minus lambda i to be a singular matrix. Now, if it is singular that means, its determinant has to be equal to 0. So, you get determinant of a minus lambda i to be equal to 0. Now, conversely suppose lambda i is a complex number such that determinant of a minus lambda i is equal to 0. So, you look at homogeneous system 
a minus lambda i z is equal to 0 vector. Now, this homogeneous system it is going to have a non trivial solution, because the coefficient matrix has determinant equal to 0. So, it has a non trivial solution u such that a minus lambda i u is equal to 0 vector and that precisely means a u is equal to lambda u, u not equal to 0 vector. So, thus the eigenvalues of a they are given by determinant of a minus lambda i is equal to 0. So, this is the determinant of a minus lambda i when you will expand the determinant you are going to have minus 1 raise to n lambda raise to n plus c n minus 1 lambda raise to n minus 1 plus c 1 lambda plus c 0 is equal to 0. So, you have a polynomial in lambda of exact degree n because the coefficient of lambda raise to n is non zero it is minus 1 raise to n. Now, by consequence of the fundamental theorem of algebra this it is going to have n roots if you count them according to their multiplicities. So, thus we know that the n by n matrix it is going to have at the most n eigenvalues and they are going to be roots of this polynomial. So, thus the problem of finding eigenvalues it gets reduced to finding roots of a polynomial. So, this determinant of a minus lambda i this polynomial now we factorize it. So, it will be lambda 1 minus lambda raise to m 1 lambda 2 minus lambda raise to m 2 into lambda k minus lambda raise to m k, where the m 1, m 2, m k they add up to n. So, you have got eigenvalues to be lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda k these are distinct eigenvalues and the power m i that is known as the algebraic multiplicity of lambda i. So, you count lambda 1 m 1 times, lambda 2 m 2 times and lambda k m k times and that is how you have got exactly n eigenvalues counted according to their algebraic multiplicity. Now, there is another multiplicity associated with eigenvalue and that is known as geometric multiplicity. So, your geometric multiplicity is going to be number of linearly independent eigenvectors associated with a particular eigenvalue. So, we have a u is equal to lambda u, u not equal to 0 vector. If I consider a of alpha u, this will be alpha times a u, a u is lambda u. So, it is alpha times lambda u. Now, alpha and lambda they are scalars those are complex numbers. So, they commute and then you can have lambda times alpha u. So, if u is an eigenvector alpha u will also be an eigenvector provided alpha is not equal to 0. So, eigenvector is not unique you have got infinitely many eigenvectors. As soon as you find one eigenvector any non-zero multiple of it is also going to be an eigenvector. Now, one defines what is known as eigenspace. So, see what you have got is suppose I have got a eigenvector, then I take a multiple. So, if you are in say R 2, you are going to have a straight line except what you do not want is multiply by 0. So, eigenspace by definition is going to be all multiples and you add 0 to it. So, all non-zero vectors in your eigenspace they are going to be eigenvectors associated with eigenvalue lambda and so there are infinitely many eigenvectors, but when you consider number of linearly independent eigenvectors they are going to be finite 
and in fact, the that number is going to be less than or equal to algebraic multiplicity. So, if you have got lambda 1 to be an eigenvalue with algebraic multiplicity to be m 1, in that case you can have at the most m 1 linearly independent eigenvectors. If the number can be less, we will consider an example where your number of linearly independent eigenvectors can be strictly less than algebraic multiplicity. Your algebraic multiplicity is you consider factorization of characteristic polynomial and in that you have lambda 1 minus lambda term whatever its power that is our algebraic multiplicity and geometric multiplicity is number of linearly independent eigenvectors associated with it. So, here is definition of eigen space null space of a minus lambda i is set of all z such that a minus lambda i z is equal to 0 vector, it is a subspace it consists of eigenvectors and a 0 vector. The dimension of this subspace is called geometric multiplicity of our eigenvalue lambda. Then as I said it is same as number of linearly independent eigenvectors associated with eigenvalue lambda and geometric multiplicity will always be less than or equal to algebraic multiplicity. So, now let me give you an example of 2 by 2 matrix a simple matrix for which in one case geometric multiplicity is strictly less than algebraic multiplicity and in another case they are equal. If your matrix is upper triangular matrix then your eigenvalues are going to be diagonal entries. So, for upper triangular matrices you do not have to do any computation just look at the diagonal entries those are your eigenvalues. Now, when you considered Gauss elimination method we reduced matrix A to upper triangular form, but these elementary row transformations they do not preserve the eigenvalues. You have matrix A it has got certain eigenvalues you do elementary row transformations obtain an upper triangular matrix, but the eigenvalues of upper triangular matrix which you have obtained will be completely different than your original eigenvalues. This elementary row transformations they do not change the solution of system A x is equal to B that is why it was useful there whereas, here it is not useful. So, now let us consider a example. So, here is upper triangular matrix 1 1 0 1 the determinant of a minus lambda is 1 minus lambda square. So, a has eigenvalue 1 with algebraic multiplicity 2. So, it is a repeated eigenvalue I look at its eigenvector. So, 1 1 0 1 u 1 u 2 is equal to u 1 u 2. So, you get u 1 plus u 2 is equal to u 1 and u 2 is equal to u 2. This second equation gives us no information. The first equation tells us that u 2 has to be 0. That means, null space of a minus i is going to be vector u 1 0 u 1 belonging to c. So, your null space of a minus i which is all u 1 0 u 1 belonging to c. So, that means, we have got multiples of vector 1 0. If you want eigen vector then it should be a non zero multiple. So, for this example 
you have got one is eigen value with algebraic multiplicity 2 and geometric multiplicity to be 1. So, geometric multiplicity is strictly less than algebraic multiplicity. Now, let me change this example slightly. Let me make this one as 2. So, when you look at matrix 1 1 0 2, its characteristic polynomial will be 1 minus lambda 2 minus lambda. So, you have got eigen values to be 1 and 2 with algebraic multiplicities in both the cases to be equal to 1. When we try to consider the eigen vector, then you are going to have u 1 plus u 2 to be equal to u 1 and 2 u 2 is equal to u 2. So, that means u 2 has to be 0 and eigen vector will be of the form u 1 0 with u 1 not equal to 0. So, 1 will be eigen vector with geometric multiplicity to be equal to 1. Next, look at 1 1 0 2 u 1 u 2 into is equal to 2 times u 1 u 2. So, what will be the first equation? It will be u 1 plus u 2 is equal to 2 u 1. Second equation will be 2 u 2 is equal to 2 u 2. So, again the second equation does not give us any information. From the first equation you will get u 1 is equal to u 2. So, any eigen vector associated with 2 will be of the form u 1 u 1 u 1 not equal to 0 or equivalently it is going to be a non zero multiple of vector u 1 1. So, eigen vector of 1 will be 1 0 or any multiple eigen vector of 2 will be vector 1 1 or any non zero multiple. So, now what we are going to do is we are going to consider eigen values of our special matrices. If the matrix is self adjoint a star is equal to a, then we will show that eigen values they have to be real. If a star is equal to minus a, then eigen values have to be purely imaginary or 0. For normal matrix, we do not have any such structure. Your eigen values can be complex, but still for eigen values of normal matrix, it has got some special property. If you look at two distinct eigen values and corresponding eigen vectors, then they are linearly independent. For normal matrix, something more is true. Eigen vectors corresponding to distinct eigen values, they are going to be perpendicular to each other. That means, their inner product is going to be 0. If you consider eigen vectors of unitary matrix, that means, the matrix which satisfies a star a is equal to a, a star is equal to identity, then the eigen values they are going to have modulus to be equal to 1. So, they will lie on unit circle. Now, what does these eigen values tell us? So, these are going to be precisely the points where a minus lambda i will not be invertible. At all other complex numbers, our matrix a minus lambda i will be invertible. So, when you have got n by n matrix, there are going to be at the most n complex numbers for which a minus lambda i will not be invertible. For all other complex numbers, a minus lambda i will be invertible. So, let us show the properties of eigen values of special matrices. The proofs are simple and straightforward. So, look at a u is equal to lambda u, u not equal to 0 vector lambda complex number. 
pre multiply by u star. So, you have got u star a u is equal to u star lambda u. So, which is same as lambda times u star u. u star u will be summation i goes from 1 to n u i u i bar. So, that is summation i goes from 1 to n mod u i square u is not a 0 vector. So, that means at least one u i will be non 0 and hence this summation will not be equal to 0. So, I get lambda to be equal to u star a u divided by u star u which is equal to in the notation of inner product it is a u comma u divided by u comma u. So, we have lambda to be equal to inner product of a u with u divided by inner product of u with u. Let me consider complex conjugate of lambda. This is going to be complex conjugate of a u with u divided by complex conjugate of u with u. Now, since inner product of u comma u is bigger than or equal to 0, here this u comma u bar will be same as u comma u and by conjugate symmetry the numerator is going to be inner product of u with a u divided by u comma u. So, thus lambda is equal to a u comma u divided by u comma u and lambda bar is u comma a u divided by u comma u. Now, lambda is also equal to this a when it goes to the second variable it goes as a star. So, it is going to be u a star u upon u comma u. Now, from here I can conclude that a star is equal to a will imply that lambda bar is equal to lambda and which will mean that lambda is going to be real because lambda is a complex number its complex conjugate is equal to itself that means, lambda has to be real. Similarly, if a star is equal to minus a then your lambda bar is minus lambda. So, if lambda is equal to x plus y. So, it is say minus x plus y and lambda bar is going to be x minus i y and hence in this case you are going to have if you have got a star is equal to minus a then lambda bar is equal to minus lambda and this means that lambda is purely imaginary or 0. So, this is for self adjoint and skew self adjoint matrices. Now, for the normal matrix, so suppose A is normal. So, you have got A A star is equal to A star A. Consider norm A x, it is Euclidean norm and it is square. This will be nothing but inner product of a x with itself. This a will go here as a a star. So, it is x a star a x. Now, use the property that a star a is same as a a star. So, it will be x a a star x which will be x now, this a I can write as a star its star a star x. So, this is same as 
a star x a star x because this a star will go to the second variable as its star. So, this is nothing but norm a star x to norm square. So, an important relation that if a is normal then Euclidean norm of a x is same as Euclidean norm of a star x. How does this property helps us for saying something about eigenvalues? So, what we have proved is if a is normal then norm a x is same as norm of a star x. Then suppose lambda is eigenvalue of a then we have got a minus lambda i u is equal to 0. So, norm of a minus lambda i u will be equal to 0. Now, a normal will mean that if I consider a minus lambda i its star that into u also will be 0. So, that will mean that lambda bar will be an eigenvalue of a star. So, a normal implies norm a x is equal to norm of a star x, it is 2 norm, then a u is equal to lambda u, u not equal to 0 vector. So, norm of a minus lambda i u will be 0, this will be same as a minus lambda i star u is equal to 0 and this is equal to a star minus lambda bar i u is equal to 0 and thus a star u is equal to lambda bar u. So, now for normal matrices the a and a star if lambda is eigenvalue of a lambda bar will be eigenvalue of a star and eigenvector is going to be the same. So, using this fact in our next lecture we will show that eigenvectors of a normal matrix associated with distinct eigenvalues they are perpendicular then I am going to state Schur's theorem, spectral theorem and then we will go to localization of eigenvalues. So, thank you.